Hello dear viewers, welcome once again to the series of lectures on the 18th century which involves the two poets John Dryden and Alexander Pope. If you remember in the last lecture that I took with you, I had discussed the literary, cultural, historical background of the 18th century and today I take you on a journey of the life of one of the most prominent figures of the 18th century uh, writing and that is John Dryden. The years of his birth and death, 1631 to 1700. So John Dryden was born in Aldwinkle, Northamptonshire in 1631. His parents were both Puritans. Puritanism is a subsect of Protestantism. Dryden proved to be a child prodigy, that is, by the age of 10, he had already read an English translation of the Greek historian Polybius. He went on to study at Westminster School. His parents were fairly well off. He went on to study at Westminster School under the headmastership of the very famous Dr. Busby. And later on, he studied at Trinity College, Cambridge. At both these institutions, he acquired a very strong classical education and he was very well versed in both Greek and Latin. In 1664, the young Dryden married Lady Elizabeth Howard, a lady of title no less. She was the daughter of the Earl of Berkshire. Now while this match brought Dryden 100 pounds a year, it didn't buy him much happiness. In 1657, Dryden continued his career. He became secretary to Sir Gilbert Pickering, the chamberlain to Oliver Cromwell, who was the Lord Protector of England at that time. If you remember, this was the period at, during which England did not have a monarch. And it was under the leadership of this gentleman called Oliver Cromwell, who called himself neither the King nor the Prime Minister, but the Lord Protector. So Dryden becomes secretary to his chamberlain and because he's allied to the Puritan party, he writes some verses on the death of Oliver Cromwell in 1659. In 1660, the very famous event called the Restoration takes place and Charles II, the monarch of England who had been in exile in France all this while, ascends the throne, that is he is restored to the throne. Dryden writes a poem welcoming him to the throne of England. In 1665, when London was reeling under the Great Plague, Dryden retired to his father-in-law's estate in Charlton. And it was here that he wrote his very famous poem, Annus Mirabilis, which was on the Great Fire of London that occurred in 1666. Now, before you begin to wonder what the Great Plague and the Great Fire of London were, they were both separate events. The Great Plague was actually the last major outbreak of bubonic plague in England. If you remember, uh, Europe, all of Europe reeled under what was called the Black Death right from the medieval, from the middle of the 13th century. And this particular outbreak was amongst the last major outbreaks of bubonic plague in, in England. So the Great Plague and of course the Great Fire of London is an event that finds a lot of mention in works of literature across the 18th century. It was a fire which started in the walled city of London and it gutted almost 80,000 houses. So this was a great fire and of course Milton, uh, sorry, Dryden commemorated it by writing the Annus Mirabilis. In 1670, which was a very climactic year for Dryden, he received literary and political recognition when he was appointed as both the poet laureate and the historiographer royal. The poet laureate meaning some form of being a national poet and the historiographer royal, of course, the person who would be making down, taking down all the records of the British royalty. And both these positions were also very lucrative positions. They fetched him about 200 pounds annually. So Dryden was now famous. He was making a lot of profit both from his literary work and his official position. I will just take you back to the previous lecture where I reminded you that the 18th century was an age in which a writer could actually earn a living by becoming a writer. So this is the time when Dryden begins to actually earn money, not just from his official position, which was a government job, but also from his writings. 
The 18th century being what it was, Dryden earned the jealousy of numerous literary men of his age, people such as Thomas Shadwell, the Duke of Buckingham, the Earl of Monmouth, etc. And these literary men sort of targeted him in their jealousy. They made fun of him in their writings, mainly in a satire called The Rehearsal. Dryden, of course, kept quiet at that time, but he retaliated later by writing one of his greatest and one of his most immortal satires, Absalom and Achitophel, in which he attacked all his critics. In 1686, Dryden becomes a Roman Catholic. Remember, he was born to Puritan parents, to Protestant parents, but later on he decides to change his religion and he becomes a Roman Catholic. Now, whether he did this because he genuinely felt attracted to Roman Catholicism or whether it was simply an expedient, a time-serving motive, one really cannot say. However, when William and Mary ascended the throne later, Dryden fell out of favour because both William and Mary, the ruling monarchs, were Protestants. His government appointments were withdrawn and so were his pensions. So here is a man who has seen the height of fame, of renown, of literary acclaim and suddenly he finds himself down and out. Not just this, Dryden also suffered the humiliation of seeing his arch-rival Thomas Shadwell succeed him as poet laureate. And now in his waning years, in his old age, he was thrown back only on his literary endeavours as a means of livelihood. But that did not deter Dryden. He was a man of steel. And he spent these last years of his life translating from the works of various classical writers like Juvenal, Perseus and Virgil. This was also the time when he wrote his very famous fables. In his last years, he lived in London and he was a habitual frequenter of the many coffee houses in London. Uh, you had Will's Coffee House, you had Burton's Coffee House and so on and so forth. And amongst these, Will's Coffee House was his favourite. It was here that an aging Dryden met the young 12-year-old Alexander Pope in Will's Coffee House. In the year 1700, he died and he was buried at Westminster Abbey in London. Now, let's look a little at Dryden's poetic style. When you look at the years of birth and death of Dryden, the years during which he lived, you realize that Dryden served as a bridge, as a connect between two very distinct ages in English literature, the age of Milton and the age of Pope. So in a sense, Dryden was the connecting factor. He was the harbinger or the forerunner of 18th century poetry in England. No English writer in the history of English literature has succeeded so well in so many varied branches or genres of writing as Dryden did. He wrote drama, he wrote poetry, he wrote satire, he translated, he was a literary critic and all in all he was what you would call the complete package. He may not be the best of dramatists, he may not be the best of poets or the best of satirists, even the best of translators or literary critics, but the fact is that he did all of these things and he was good at all of them. Dryden was the one who understood most effectively the possibilities of the heroic couplet and he was the one who established it as the fashion for satiric, didactic as well as descriptive poetry. All of Dryden's poetry is written in the heroic couplet. He experimented with it, he gave it form, he gave it shape and he made it the standard for 18th century poetry. Now there was something very interesting and very significant about the manner and the things that Dryden wrote. He showed a Janus-like capacity of belonging to contradictory ideologies in one single lifetime and of effectively defending or propagating all of them. Janus, of course, as you would all know, is the two is the uh, the two-faced god in Roman mythology. He looks both into the past and the present. In Dryden's case, of course, he was not looking into the past or the present, but the idea is that he was able to effectively write about contending ideologies at different points of time and like a good debater to be able to defend whichever side he was on. 
An example of this, when he was working as secretary to the Chamberlain to Oliver Cromwell, he wrote stanzas on the death of Cromwell, heroic stanzas. And in 1660, when Charles II, the monarch, ascended the throne, he wrote in praise of Charles II. So effectively, he was defending both democracy while writing for Oliver Cromwell and monarchy as well while writing for Charles II. He also wrote both in favor of Protestantism and in favor of Roman Catholicism when he changed his beliefs from Protestantism to Roman Catholicism. During the Restoration period, Dryden was amongst the best known of the dramatists. The Restoration period demanded risk and bombastic drama, risk in the sense of lewd or body themes, bombastic in the sense of high-flying, rhetorical, heroic themes, full of blast and fustian. He wrote such plays to great success. He also wrote about contemporary social and political events. We have his Annus Mirabilis, the poem that he wrote on the Great Fire of London. He, we have his Absalom and Achitophel, which was actually a take on the Popish plot that was going on at that particular time. He was also very quick to respond to his literary rivals in very sharp satires. So you have Mechflechno, which is an example of that. You also have Absalom and Achitophel, which is not just a description of the Popish plot, but a poem in which Dryden got back stanza by stanza against those literary rivals who had attacked him in previous days. Dryden also used his knowledge of the classical languages, both Greek and Latin, to translate the works of the ancient writers, Perseus, Virgil, Juvenal. Now, let us look at some of Dryden's principal works. Dryden's literary life falls into three very distinct periods. So, first of all, you have his early years, up to about 1681. This was the period of drama. This is the period when Dryden is writing restoration drama, as the genre is called. And he wrote plays in the restoration period because it was a paying proposition. It was what the public wanted. It was what the court of King Charles II wanted. And in order to get his bread and butter, he wrote such drama. Now, of course, none of them are really great drama. They are not plays that you would hold up as examples. But some of the major ones that Dryden wrote are heroic tragedies. Uh, for example, The Indian Emperor. This was interestingly a play on Aurangzeb. And another play called The Conquest of Granada. The next period, the next literary period in his life would be from 1681 to 1688. And this is the period during which Dryden wrote all his greatest works. And then the waning years of his life, when he was deprived of his poet laureateship and his position as historiographer royal, the last few years of his life, 1689 to 1700, which involved miscellaneous productions like his translations, his fables, a few odes, etc. So we can see that Dryden's important works can be classified into the following um, let us say, genres or spheres. Uh, his political works, the heroic stanzas written in 1659, I've already discussed these, in praise of Cromwell. And the very opposite of that, Astray Redux in 1660, welcoming Charles II to the English throne after the Restoration. Another of his political works, Annus Mirabilis in 1667, which is about the great fire of London. Then we come to his satirical works. So we have Absalom and Achitophel in 1681, which is on the Popish plot. Then we have the Medal in 1682, which is a satire against sedition. In 1682, very quickly again, we have McFlecknow, a satire which attacked Thomas Shadwell. More about Shadwell and McFlecknow in my subsequent lectures. Then we have a very important poem that he wrote in favour of the Anglican Church. The Anglican Church was the Protestant Church of England and I'm sure you would all be aware that Henry VIII, the first amongst the most major uh, kings of England, was the first person to break off from the Roman Catholic Church and establish a separate church called the Church of England, the Anglican Church. And here is John Dryden writing in 1682 an essay called Religio Laici or the religion of the layman. 
which is a poem in favor of the Church of England, also called the Anglican Church. The next poem that he wrote in 1687, which is The Hind and the Panther, this is the time when Dryden was converted to Roman Catholicism and he writes a poem in defense of the Roman Catholic Church and this time it is the hind and the panther. Then you have a few odes that Dryden wrote and one of the odes I believe is also in your course. Uh, so he writes a song for Saint Cecilia's day. Saint Cecilia is I think the patron saint of music. So a song for Saint Cecilia's day in 1687 and he writes Alexander's feast or the power of music in 1697 and in his waning years he writes the fables and also his miscellaneous translations. So that uh, dear students uh, was a brief description of the life and the works of this very seminal very important poet of the late 17th and the early 18th century John Dryden. He has been the single most influential poet on the scene and between him and the final poet of the 18th century, Dr. Samuel Johnson, lies an entire age that was extremely unique in its literary qualities and also in the fact that this was a period that saw England at its quietest, peaceful best. Dryden, like the other writers of his age and time, was a very not just a very prolific writer, but also a very informed writer. He was very well versed, he was very well aware of what was going on in his country at that time. He was not a paper messiah writing simply about things that interested him or about the very high literary things that most writers would want to write. He, like most writers of his age, was very involved in the political, social, cultural life of his age. And this is significant because uh, most of the battles that took place during the age of Dryden were not really fought with the sword, but they were fought with the word. And these writers who did not agree with each other because they all had very strong, very distinct ideas of how to carry forward a debate. And they also had very strong ideas about what is right and what is wrong. Somehow they took it upon themselves to become the custodians of morals, the custodians of the correct codes of conduct, the custodians of the right values in literature. And they wrote works that either highlighted or satirized or tried to amend the vices and the follies that existed in society. And it is because of this reason that the 18th century is also called the age of satire. I shall be talking more about satire when I will be giving you my introduction to uh, John Dryden's poem McFleckno, which is in your course. Till then, goodbye. See you soon.